So you just had an ego-shattering psychedelic trip and are wondering how a singular substance could possibly launch somebody into such a foreign state of consciousness. Maybe you've used psychedelics to help with your depression, anxiety, or other psychological disorder. Maybe you've used psychedelics for creative purposes, like to create better art or music or something. Or maybe you've used psychedelic for spiritual or religious purposes. Or maybe you haven't. Maybe you haven't even tripped before and are just interested in how these substances work in the brain. This video will cover all that we currently know about what goes on in the brain under psychedelics. So it's important to note that almost all psychedelics are tryptamines. Take a look at the molecular structure of LSD, DMT, and psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. They all look pretty similar, right? Now take a look at the structure of the neurotransmitter serotonin, which plays a key role in mood regulation, social behavior, and a few other activities. It doesn't take a keen eye to see the similarity between these three psychedelics and serotonin. So the way these psychedelics work is, as they make their way into the brain, and because they resemble serotonin so closely, they bind with and activate many of the receptors that serotonin would have otherwise activated. The receptor that psychedelics have the strongest affiliation with is the 5-HT2A receptor, which is found all throughout the brain and most heavily concentrated in the evolutionarily most recent part of the brain what many call the human cortex. And it was found by Swiss scientist Franz Volweider in 1998 that certain psychedelics such as LSD actually fit the 5-HT2A receptor better than serotonin itself does, leading scientists to believe that there is another endogenous chemical produced by the brain with the purpose of activating the 5-HT2A receptors. Many think this endogenous chemical could be DMT, as it's been confirmed to be produced in the pineal gland of rats and is believed to possibly be for humans as well. Anyway, that's besides the point. So there's one part of the brain that psychedelics have a particularly strong impact on, and that's the default mode network, or DMN for short. This part of the brain is strongly affiliated with our sense of self and our individuality. Many newer scientists refer to this part of the brain as the me network. It's in this part of the brain that the story of who we are and who we want to be is created. Understanding this region of the brain is crucial in understanding psychedelic neuroscience. So as studies using fMRI brain scans show, the DMN is the part of the brain that lights up when we daydream, perform self-reflection, worry, and ruminate. All very ego-related activities. When there's no immediate tasks to perform, this is the part of the brain that takes over. However, when we're active, constantly performing tasks, and are in flow state, the default mode network is significantly less active. This is why in the book How to Change Your Mind, author Michael Pollan described the DMN as having a seesaw relationship with various other parts of the brain. The DMN operates from a lack of sensory stimuli in the outside world. And when there is a lack of sensory input and there are no tasks to perform, many other parts of the brain go offline, allowing the DMN to become active, causing us to self-reflect and daydream. Because think about it, we really only daydream and self-reflect when we have nothing else to do. And the same goes for the other way around. When we have that sensory input and have a task to perform, the DMN becomes less active and other brain functions turn on that are needed to complete the task. But the default mode network never goes completely inactive, at least in a typical sober state, as we're always taking in information and relating it to what we've experienced in the past, how it can serve our well-being in the present, and potentially how it can be useful for us in the future. This is why neuroscientist Robin Carhart Harris, who has played a pivotal role in psychedelic neuroscience, describes the DMN as the brain's capital city as it's constantly holding all the systems in the brain together, ensuring one system does not interfere with and overwhelm another. The DMN literally acts as a filter 
for what our brain decides to let into our awareness. It's an evolutionary byproduct causing us to only focus on what best serves us in the given moment. Without the DMN, our brain would be so overloaded, we descend into madness. Because of this part of the brain, our experience of reality is based solely on the small fraction of sensory input our brain decides to focus on by relating it to why it's significant and how it can be useful for us in this very moment. As Michael Pollan describes it, our brain causes us to live in a controlled hallucination. However, under psychedelics, DMN activity drastically decreases, as proven by multiple psilocybin studies using fMRI scans. And going back to the seesaw relationship described earlier, as DMN activity goes down, activity in other regions of the brain spike. And DMN activity doesn't just go down on psychedelics, it plummets. And when DMN activity drops, activity in other brain regions are let loose and become very active, much more so than they would be in a sober state. Take a look at these two models of a sober brain versus a tripping brain. Each color represents a different region of the brain. I'm not sure which colors represent which regions, but you get the idea that there are so many times more connections for a tripping brain versus a sober one. Michael Pollan notes in his book, usual lines of communications within the brain become radically reorganized when the DMN goes offline. Previously, many of these parts of the brain were linked centrally via the DMN, but because the DMN has gone inactive, these parts of the brain quickly spring new connections with each other, connections that during typical everyday life, we simply don't have. These new connections could manifest themselves during a psychedelic experience as an amazing insight, fascinating perspective, or just the overall new giving of meaning to things. Some of these insights and new meanings can be completely pointless and stupid, but some can be revolutionary and potentially life-changing. It's also important to note that this increase in neural connections definitely has the potential to cause the brain to become overloaded with stimulation, and that the brain as a whole is just a pattern recognizing machine that tries to make sense of everything it experiences to the best of its ability. So when thousands, perhaps even millions of these new neural connections form, the brain could leap to premature conclusions in an attempt to make sense of the massive amount of data rushing through it, which could result in a hallucination and could manifest as seeing a face in the clouds or thinking that a tree looks gay or something. So the higher dose of a psychedelic someone takes, the more of these neural connections they'll have, which also means that there will be less activity in the DMN, because remember, it's a seesaw relationship. And the DMN can actually become so inactive that users have what is called an ego death, in which they lose all sense of subjective self-identity. Our sense of individuality relies between the subject, us, and the object, everything else. And the default mode network is the part of the brain that's created the subject, us. And when that completely melts away, so do the boundaries between the self and the outside world. In a complete ego death, everything appears to merge into one. Everything simply just is, as there is no distinction between subject and object. There is no self and not self. And this leads many users to saying things after the trip, such as, we are all one, or everything is one. The melting away of the subject into their surrounding environment is the epitome of a mystical experience. And the reason so many people who experience ego death say that what they experienced is objectively true or that it felt more real than real. They say that because they didn't have the experience from a state of subjectivity in which they're constrained by their personal biases. They had the experience from a state of more or less objectivity in which they're able to analyze the stimuli they're experiencing from a raw state of consciousness without tying everything back to their ego and how it can serve them. So with the quieting of the DMN and the massive increase in neural connections taking place, we're really able to dive deep into our subconscious. And when we say we're having a psychedelic trip, the trip part really is just referring to a trip to the subconscious mind. It's common under the influence of psychedelics to have memories come up that you didn't realize you still had, or to be faced with buried traumas or repressed thoughts. It's the combination of the increase of neural connections and the quieting of the ego that allows these repressed memories or thoughts to surface. The neural connection increase makes the memories more likely to be remembered, and the quieting of the DMN makes it less likely for the ego to suppress them. 
which is why the psychedelic realm is a common place for people to come to terms with the darkest parts of them, parts of them the ego had suppressed for years. The brain during a psychedelic experience can actually be compared to, believe it or not, the brain of a young child. This is because the DMN isn't fully developed until adulthood, so for a young child, this part of the brain is pretty much absent. A three or four year old kid doesn't really have a sense of self. Maybe they know their name, but not much more than that. And it's actually been found that children have more neural connections than an adult, like a lot more. So children don't have a developed default mode network and have way more neural connections? Well, this sounds quite like a psychedelic experience, which led Paul into writing in his book, children approach reality with the astonishment of an adult on psychedelics. He also referred to adults having what is called spotlight consciousness and children as having lantern consciousness. The thinking patterns of adults gradually become more narrow as they age, like a spotlight, while the brain of children are still very plastic. Perhaps this is why it's so hard to change the political beliefs of an old man whose neural pathways have become gradually more rigid as he's thought the same way his entire life versus a young child who you could literally convince of anything. But as an individual goes through adolescence, many of these neural connections die off, the default mode network develops, the ego fully emerges, and you start seeing everything and how it can serve you, and you stop seeing the world in the magical light a child does. Unless you take a psychedelic, of course. So it can be said that as we develop, order within the mind increases. We're no longer just a wandering, curious child in awe everything. We're now grown up with a fully intact sense of self, who knows who they are and hopefully have a sense of purpose. And we act in accordance with who we think we are and who we want to be. It's like a set of guidelines our brain operates under. And it's useful, don't get me wrong, if our brains were still as plastic as a child's, we'd literally get nothing done. However, there are some drawbacks in our minds developing order as we grow up. What happens when this complex self-reflection and contemplation we're able to perform as adults becomes excessive? Perhaps to the point our introspection becomes so uncontrollable, it literally dictates our lives and alters the way we see and act in this world. Well, this is where mental disorders such as depression, anxiety, OCD, certain psychological addictions, and various other disorders come in. As countless studies have linked an increase of mind wandering and self-reflecting, which is a key characteristic of the DMN, with an overall increase in unhappiness, which could manifest themselves in one of these various disorders. The quieting of the DMN during a psychedelic trip is precisely why they can be useful in helping people with these psychological disorders. As neuroscientist Robin Carhart Harris states, a high dose psychedelic experience has the potential to shake the snow globe meaning that psychedelics can disrupt the typical patterns of thought that are the cause of these negative effects on the said individual's life, allowing more ideal thought patterns to come in. With a decrease of default mode network activity, the ego's grip on the mind is loosened. Many psychedelics promote neurogenesis, which means that neural pathways can be permanently altered. So for a person with, say, intense depression, psychedelics could shake up their ways of thinking just enough so that the patient is able to achieve a major breakthrough with their disorder. There are thousands of stories out there of people using psychedelics to effectively combat their various psychological disorders. Psychedelics operate much differently than everyday prescription pills because they act as serotonin. They set off that receptor that serotonin would have otherwise activated, whereas most prescription pills work to regulate or inhibit the serotonin receptors, meaning that for the treatment to be effective, the user must constantly keep taking the medication so that the receptors are constantly inhibited. With psychedelics, the neural pathways of the individual can literally change, meaning the disorder has the potential to be cured, perhaps forever. In other words, psychedelics get rid of the problem, and everyday prescription pills just block out the problem, but do nothing to cure it. Psychedelics can cure a disorder with just one or a few uses. Prescription pills must be taken for life. Of course, pharmaceutical companies want nothing to do with psychedelics. The pharmaceutical companies want money. And the way they're going to get the most money is by keeping somebody medicated for life through the prescription pills they give them. Anyway guys, this has been the gist of what we currently know about how psychedelics work in the brain. Most of the information gathered for this video was in the book How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan, so definitely check that out if you haven't. And just because we've reduced everything that happens on a psychedelic trip to mere constructs and actions that happen in the brain, 
That does not mean we should discredit them in any way, shape, or form. Consciousness is still a magical thing. We have no idea how it is that we're conscious. There is no evidence that consciousness is produced in the brain. We have no clue what consciousness is. Just because we can reduce what happens on a psychedelic trip to mere constructs in the brain does not mean we should discredit these experiences as any less magical than they are. I'll leave you with this quote to think about by Michael Pollan himself. The price of the sense of an individual identity is a sense of separation from others and nature.